Okay, I don't know how in the hell I'm gonna be able to do this movie justice, but here we go. Today we're taking a look at the sequel to Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Of course, this comes to us from the creative minds of Phil Lord and Chris Miller, along with directors Joaquin Dos Santos, Kemp Powers, and Justin Thompson, and starring the voice talents of Shamik Moore, Haley Steinfeld, and Oscar Isaac, among many, 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 many others. After a long time spent in their own universes, Gwen Stacy is finally reunited with Miles Morales. And she takes him to the center of the Spider-Verse, where they meet countless spider people. They have formed a coalition of sorts led by Miguel O'Hara, aka Spider-Man 2099. Their job is to preserve the timeline and what they refer to as canon events that are consistent among all spider people across all spider universes. And a super villain, well, maybe not so super, at least not at first, known as The Spot, is wreaking havoc across these universes, and the spider people have to stop him. This may very well end up being my favorite movie of the year. I know the year is only about halfway over, but this is gonna be hard to top. I very much enjoyed Into the Spider-Verse, and this takes everything that made that movie great and cranks it up to 11. Thousand. They crammed so much shit into this movie, and yet it doesn't feel like they did too much, and that is an incredible balancing act that they pulled off. Even with everything going on, and there is a lot going on, none of it feels unnecessary. It is still very much Miles' story, and Shamik Moore, no relation, does an excellent job. He's very good at conveying the loneliness that Miles feels after all of his fellow spider people have gone back to their own universes. He is still good with the quips, as any spider person should be, though it does come back to bite him. Early on, he chastises the spot for calling it an ATM machine because the M already stands for machine. But then later on, he meets an Indian Spider-Man from the city of Mumbatan, which I guess means Mumbai and Manhattan have somehow merged in one universe. Maybe it's like San Francisco and Big Hero 6. And Miles says, ooh, I love chai tea. And the guy's like, what do you mean chai tea? Chai is just the word for tea. That's like calling it TT. Miles, I hope you learned your lesson. No one likes a grammar Nazi. Or any kind of Nazi, really. This time around, we also have a much bigger focus on Gwen Stacy, once again played by Haley Steinfeld. In fact, the movie opens in Gwen's universe. It takes a little while before we even get to Miles. Her father is a police captain, and she's operating as Spider-Woman in secret. And she's also very lonely, not just because she has to conceal her identity, but because, much like Miles, she doesn't have very many friends outside of the Spider-People. And she's very frustrated about having to hide who she is, and she wishes she could be more honest about her identity, especially with her father, but she's afraid of how he's going to react, and this is probably a metaphor for something. Spot, who is voiced by Jason Schwartzman, was an interesting choice for the villain. I don't think he's one of the more memorable members of Spider-Man's rogues gallery, but it actually worked very well, and I liked how they incorporated his powers into the plot. And I love how he keeps complaining about being treated like the villain of the week, which I think is a little bit of meta-commentary, because... In the comics, I believe he pretty much was just the villain of the week. We got more new spider people than you can shake a stick at. We have Spider-Woman Jess Drew, who is this badass chick on a motorcycle. We got Hobie Brown, aka the Spider-Punk, who is really more concerned about fighting the establishment rather than crime, although he'd probably tell you they're one and the same. He was fun. And of course, we have Oscar Isaac as Miguel O'Hara, Spider-Man 2099. He is basically in charge of the Spider Society, and boy does this guy have some issues. Many spider people like to quip. He does not quip. But he's not angry without reason. He has been through a lot. And I hesitate to say too much more about the plot and the characters because I don't want to spoil too much, but it's a very well-crafted story. And it does end on a cliffhanger, as this was intended from the beginning to be a part one of two. We'll see how it feels next year when we have Beyond the Spider-Verse and we can look at the big picture, but Across the Spider-Verse doesn't feel overly long, it doesn't really drag, the pacing was fine, there weren't really any jokes that didn't land, it's just very good stuff happening. Much like the last movie, every Spider-Person and their Earth has its own animation style, and it all looks fantastic. This is one of the best-looking animated movies I've ever seen. The action sequences in particular are just breathtaking. And there are so many cameos and Easter eggs going on here, I could not possibly list them all. Even a few live-action cameos, which should feel completely out of place here, but somehow it works. Really, my only gripe is the sound mixing needed a little bit of work in a few spots, especially during Gwen's opening monologue. With the music being so loud, I could barely hear her. 
This is one of those weird things about modern filmmaking. I know there was a time when we understood how to make sure the dialogue was heard, but somehow we lost track of that. But that's a minor nitpick. Apart from that, everything in this movie is fucking amazing, and you all need to see it if you haven't already. Whether you see it in the theater or at home, doesn't matter. One way or another, see this movie. And that's all I have to say about Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Till next time, take care.